Slap tears and slap tear rehab. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into whether the type of exercise that we prescribe for a slap tear injury carries over to other types of shoulder injuries. We're going to define slap tears. We're going to talk about other common injuries and then whether there is a crossover between how you train for both. We're going to also talk about best practices for both. I've got my good friend, Phil White from Phil White Physio joining us again. He's an expert on the matter of slap tears. He's had his own slap tear, as have I. So we've got a lot of skin in the game. Strap yourself in. This is going to be a good one. Welcome to the Unity Gym Podcast, brought to you by VPA Australia, our trusted supplement source since day one. As VPA-sponsored athletes, we're excited to offer you a special 10% discount on their premium supplements available worldwide. Just use our discount code listed in the episode description. Today's episode is also sponsored by the Slap Tear Rehab Blueprint. If you're overwhelmed by rehab tips on social media, our blueprint provides clear results-based methods to help you return to your favorite activities faster and stronger than surgery can get you there. Best of all, it's free. Grab it through the link in our description. If you'd like a personalized slap tear rehab program tailored to your needs and goals and support every step of the way via online one-on-one coaching, check out my slap tear rehab program. To get started, click the link in the description, create an account, complete a short pre-exercise questionnaire, and I'll welcome you on the inside. And remember, as Amazon affiliates, you can get all the equipment used in our videos and podcasts at competitive prices through our affiliate links in the description. Now let's dive into today's episode. Phil, how are you today? So well, well, tired from a toddler who just loves to wake up in the middle of the night, but apart from that, feeling good, hyped for more slap tear chat because it's, um, yeah, again, as you said, something we've both experienced and both worked our way through and it's so nice to like, yeah, see some of the comments coming through from people who've been helped by what we've talked about. So this is actually, th- this whole show is actually sort of off the back of a plethora of questions, all related to the same thing. You know, people are interested in our slap tear content that we've been creating and they're asking whether the type of workout, we have a slap tear rehab program that's been launched and it's doing really well. A lot of people have signed up, check out the Google reviews. There's a lot, it's quite, it's quite amazing the type of results people are getting within 28 days and they're so shocked and it's you know it's funny because there's really no magic we talk about this all the time it's just a really straightforward principle of training structural balance understanding first of all your diagnosis and what it means and learning to train around that but then also what we're going to talk about today learning to train systems like joint systems as opposed to movements in isolation and that's going to be a big part of today's discussion what does that mean phil uh Okay. Do you mean what does joint system mean? Yeah. What does it mean yeah. to train joint joint systems yeah. uh, as opposed to you know treating everything in isolation? So yeah. I, we, think, I, used to, I, mean, I used to use the term compartmentalizing your body. Yeah, it's a really interesting one at the moment where I'm like I'm doing a lot of work online helping people sort of fifty to seventy five start strength training, and it's interesting with like that cohort where strength wasn't a normal thing for people to to train. Just how like I guess overwhelming. The idea of doing strength exercise can be, and I can totally relate because when I first started training in the gym before I met Yanni, who convinced me to give Unity a go, I was, you know, equally overwhelmed by just like how many op- options there are for different exercises. And now, like looking at my one of the apps that I use to prescribe exercises, it's something like three thousand two hundred exercises I could prescribe. And when you sort of look at like each individual exercise without the context of systems, it just becomes totally overwhelming. And there's no like, and it you know, of all the 3000s, like, what do you do and how do you progress it? So when thinking about the sort of approach to training that is in the UMS app, it's, it's looking at like fundamental movements, which come down to like, what area, like, what are the main movements that each area of the body do? And then how do you get those main movements and train them in a structurally balanced way so that you can create a joint system that is really highly functional. So when talking systems, it's like, you know, you might think of like each area of the body and particularly around each sort of major joint as being a system in and of itself. And then when looking at a rehab approach and we're going to use shoulders here, we think about the shoulder system, when you have different injuries, some like it's not always like, I remember I had a client recently who had an MRI saying, you know, a they had a impingement shoulder and like subacromial narrowing, which is basically like an impingement of the shoulder joint that like some rotator cuff tears, some biceps tenosynovitis, so aggravation of the biceps tendon, some degenerative slap tear, like, you know, you, a lot of people would think like, okay, they've done separate injuries to cause each of those individually when really often these sort of like low level injuries to many structures 
that aren't related to one acute incident, the sign of a dysfunctional system that isn't balanced and working ideally. So yeah, when like I just think that that's the most helpful way to think about exercise is like, okay, what are the fundamental movements and how do I use those to then balance out a joint system? Nice. And so I think this is a good segue into discussing that I, 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 I assume not everyone that's listening or watching has seen our uh, previous podcast episodes. We've done quite a few up to this date and, and it's all part of a series that you can obviously access through our podcast or on YouTube. But just in case someone hasn't caught the prior or previous episodes, let's quickly define a slap tear. And then let's also, I guess, discuss other common shoulder injuries and talk about the differences. Because I know off camera, you said that there is some important discussion that needs to take place around the difference, especially between the type of injury, you know, like a tendinopathy as opposed to a, a tear. Yeah, yeah for sure. But first, let's start um, by, by defining again what a slap tear is. Yeah, so I guess when thinking about like what the anatomical structure is, it's it's an injury to your labrum, and your labrum is basically a cartilage like disc in your shoulder. So your shoulder is a ball and socket joint. It's a very open socket as opposed to your hip, which is quite a like deep and enclosed one because it's very important for like less movement, more weight bearing ability. But for our shoulders, we have a nice open socket with a really large ball. That means we can in conjunction with the scapula being able to move, access these great ranges of motion up overhead, produce force through a great range of motion, as opposed to the ball and socket joint in the hip, which is much more closed down, much more inherently stable by being a, a completely enclosed system as opposed to the shoulder that's yeah kind of open to allow that movement. So to facilitate stability in that system, we've got active structures and passive structures. So active structures are your muscles, and then your passive structures are basically the bones, ligaments, joint capsules, and cartilage. So anything you can't contract. So the labrum there is a passive structure that helps keep the ball in the middle of the socket to allow movement and force production without dislocating your shoulder. Because again, muscles aren't smart. They can't like fine tune things in and of it's like one, when I say that, I mean like one muscle isn't smart. So a pec, if it contracts, will just swing the arm around into a, um, a, a flexed, internally rotated and horizontally adducted position. It takes all of the other muscles together to then control that movement so you don't just get an anterior dislocation. But then you've got these passive structures, so your labrum being one of them, as a backup system to make sure that you're keeping the like keeping the bones in the right sort of place. So structurally, a slap tear is a tear to that labrum. It's a like superior labrum, anterior posterior tear is why it's called slap. It's not from slapping people or being slapped, though I guess it could be. But yeah, it, it, and then when it comes to labral tears, there are a whole series of different types, and we'll go through those in a different episode because I don't want to get too distracted and off course from what we're talking about today. But yeah, really important to understand that like there are different types. Other different types sometimes do need different management. But if I'm just assuming it, and please disclaimer, like make sure you're working with a professional, you've had the diagnosis, you know what's going on before you, um, yeah, and don't use this as like specific injury advice just content around it sorry i always have to say these disclaimers of the physio because yeah it's definitely more like a very regulated profession anyway so yeah basically like what we're looking at here is the cartilage in the socket but then when looking at different shoulder injuries it's often the case that with a dysfunctional system that you can you know as i said have maybe a bit of a bit of like labral tear but that same system problem leads to things like a shoulder impingement, rotator cuff tears, bicep tenosynovitis, or tendinopathies as well. So, yeah, that's hopefully that's helpful in terms of what we're looking at. Absolutely. Did you explain the difference between tendinopathy and tear in that? Yeah. So when looking at like different types of injuries, obviously there's going to be things like tears, which can be acute or more on the chronic side of things. So that's looking at muscles and, and, and sometimes tendons, but things like a, a tendinopathy or people will you know, hear of it as a tendinitis or a tendinosis, the old school names for it. But tendinopathy is basically like an, an aggravation of the tendon, which is a muscle where the muscle attaches to the bone. And you know, we used to talk about tendinopathy so often we, we like golfer's elbow and a few other ones, but yeah, basically it's like generally from a load error. So doing too much too soon, something your body's not quite prepared for. We've had a bunch of time off and then you come back and you do too much. So it's not a like classic muscle tear. You have a breakdown or you have like a dysfunctional repair of the like tendon structures or the collagen fibers where it's, it's like trying to make up for this like lack of capacity by quickly laying down new structures and it does it in a not very helpful way. So that's a tendinopathy. And so really important to understand like 
you know, when thinking about do, do the exercises that are in the slap tear program help these other injuries? Like it will definitely depend on the injuries. And that's why it's really important to work with a professional because for things like a tendinopathy, you know, you want to be like quite specifically loading and overloading the tendon to facilitate a, you know, the restructuring of these, these fibers. And for acute tear, you obviously want to be not overloading an acute tear. You want to give it time to heal, but you also want to do give it, like you also need to provide it with some level of, you know, stimulation and in protected areas. So the thing is that like, sometimes it really matters to be hyper-specific, but the great thing about the body in rehab is like really, you know, we all have fairly, you know, there are, there is variation, but fundamentally we do have all these, like, I guess, fundamental movements. And if we can get them balanced and understand the training variables of strength training, which I've talked to about before of the level of resistance, the volume, the speed, the range of motion, and then the complexity is generally the same exercises. If like tailored to your specific needs with those variables, you can be doing the same movements, but be helping build the system as a whole. So, and, and to, to, to just dive into that a little bit deeper, your specific needs. So, so I, I, I'm just going to put myself into the, the the mindset of someone who knows very little about this, and they're thinking, okay, what does that mean for me? You know, and so what are what what are some of the variables that we need to take into consideration when we're t- t- uh, when we're putting the consideration of someone's specific needs at, at the forefront of the discussion? So things like training age. You know, w- uh, what else would you w- would you recommend? Yeah, so part of it will be like the specific injuries. So if you've had like a acute tear, if you're in that really acute state of an injury, so, you know, especially the first 72 hours or, you know, if it's a bad sort of tear for either the muscle or the labrum, like you definitely want to let some level of just natural healing take its course. And you might do some very limited range of motion, very limited resistance work in the shoulder and using that pain as a, a real like signal of what you should and shouldn't do. Cause again, like we've talked about pain science plenty of times, but it is your body's perception of perceived, like, sorry, it is your body's expression of perceived threat and acute injuries. Like pain is so helpful. It'll tell you what to do and what not to do. <laughs> um, and obviously work with professional to like really decipher what you can push through and whatnot. But a general rule is like, if you're in that acute stage of an injury, so particularly the first few weeks, like really listen to your pain and, and don't do things that, that make it angry, particularly things that are making it stay angry. So if you do something and then it hurts for like minutes, hours, days afterwards, like you really want to be careful with those things. But when it comes to chronic pain and like once you've kind of got past like the initial period of time where tissue healing is sort of taking its place, which typically for muscles is that sort of six week, eight week mark, depending on the type of tear you have. Um, but then for, you know, your tendons and, and ligaments often and cartilage often that like kind of 12 week, 16 week and beyond. Like if you've kind of passed that time of like initial acute injury healing, then pain can be less uh, accurate in, in its expression of perceived threat. Cause there's so many other factors that then go into chronic pain, which again, won't get sidetracked by now, but you want to like understand okay, what's like, what structures were initially injured? What structures, um, and, and even uh, like, we've talked about this before about like, do you need to get a scan and, you know, is a, like a diagnosis without scans enough? Like, yeah, you want to make sure you're screening for the really serious things that could potentially need different management like surgery, but a generalized approach to like identifying, okay, what areas are you like with your training age, as you said before, like, have you done lots of pushing and pulling, but never done any external rotation, for example, or have you only done pushing and you've never done any pulling because you've just done kind of mirror muscle bodybuilding style and then identifying, okay, like with your personal experience, like what do we need to like do more of and what do we maybe need to back off a little bit? So yeah, again, it's a bit hard to talk about this in a way of like, (laughs) um, like when there's so many different things that could be happening, but the general takeaway is like identifying, like thinking about that kind of, what was that, that show, The Weakest Link back in the day with that yeah. <laughs> angry redheaded lady on Australian TV? They're like, you are the weakest link. Like thinking yeah. about the, like, what's that weakest link in your system? What haven't you done before that is part of this like structural balance piece? And then bringing up those weak links while maintaining the training and strength in those areas that you're stronger in will make the system stronger yeah look when we i can speak from experience for for when people come to work with us with rad and i in 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 unity gym or or the unified movement system whether they're coming in for a slap tear or other shoulder related issue or compromise 
you know, we look at a lot of factors and beyond the obvious, what equipment do you have at hand? How much time availability do you have to put into this? But one of the key things that we look at is how consistently have they been training up to the point of injury? So if they're training only two days a week in strength and conditioning, then we wouldn't give them a program that, you know, pushes beyond what their body's already capable of. It's kind of like that, you know, the, the, there's this common notion for a woman who's who falls pregnant, whether they should or shouldn't exercise. And it was a really hot, hotly debated topic for a while, but then we came to a consensus that really the worst thing they can do is change what they're already doing. You know, you, if, if you're doing strength training three or four days a week, then keep doing it. You know, if you're, if you're exercising already, then, then, you know, stopping exercise just because you've, you've, you've had, you've fallen pregnant is probably not the smartest thing to do. Now I'm not, I'm certainly not suggesting that an injured person is like a pregnant woman, but I'm just using this as an analogy because that would sound terrible. Uh, but if someone comes that are injured, then we look at how, what are they doing already? What have they done in the past? Of course, the diagnosis of injury, and then we take these variables into consideration when we're designing the right program for them. And it will be different for everybody. You know, if you're used to a high level, high frequency, high volume of exercise, then you're going to be able to do more in your rehab than someone who's not used to training at all. Because, you know, only a little bit of stimulus is going to be plenty for someone who's not already doing strength training. You know, it, when, when you come injured, it's not the time to radically increase the amount of load you're putting on your whole body. Because remember, you still need to you know get that load management variable right you know so there's there's that that we consider there's someone's age that we consider you know because as as we get older stimulus affects the body differently the body recovers slightly differently you know and and then other lifestyle factors like how how what's your recovery scenario like like are you like phil or myself with young kids at home with very heavily disrupted sleep what's your nutrition like you know are you eating right to sustain an increase in resistance training exercise you need to obviously increase your your dietary protein intake to sort of furnish the the amount of stimulus remember that when we work out when we exercise that's just the stimulus the catalyst is recovery and 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 nutrition based you know so whether we're, we're we're you know getting that muscle protein syn synthesis from our dietary protein and that sort of thing so there's lo there's lots of the, the sort of variables yeah, that we take into there, it is so multifactorial obviously with with strength and training, but I guess kind of like zooming back in on the question of like, is this slap tear program going to help other things? The answer is 100% yes. Like there's nothing in the program, which is like, I guess when I think about like, what does make an injury better? It's not like loading torn, like there's no like cartilage exercise you can do that like you're doing reps on your cartilage. <laughs> Obviously like doing a bicep curl when you're, you have a slap tear is going to mean that the attachment site into the cartilage is going to be stressed. And certainly like level of like stress on the cartilage, if done appropriately, can lead to improvement. But like the, the, the key thing in here is like, it's not doing that that's making the slap tear better. It's like functionally unloading it by making the whole system stronger and supporting the muscles around it. And as I said before, it's so often that you do get these like concurrent injuries of you have like some level of slap tear, some level of impingement, some level of rotator cuff aggravation, some level of bicep tennis arthritis, which is that stabby pain at the front of the shoulder because of this like dysfunctional system and with the way that the UMS is structured, like it's all about how do you make, how do we make these systems as strong as possible? And so with the slap tear rehab program, like there's a bit more sort of specific exercises, which is kind of taking the really common weak links that, that you guys have seen over the years of working with people. And those are typically going to be ones around specific rotator cuff exercises because most of the time people, again, haven't had the experience of, of doing those exercises or haven't done them in a progressively overloaded way. So their stability muscles, which help, again, the role of the rotator cuff is to keep the ball in the middle of the socket, which is also what the job of the labrum is. So by making those stronger, it unloads the labrum functionally and helps it have a good environment for healing and ideally like not get aggravated because those muscles are so active. So if you do have a rotator cuff tear, that's like not in a really aggressive acute stage or not a complete rupture, then doing those exact same exercises are going to be the thing that also like facilitates the healing. If you're looking at tendinopathies, again, I talked about how it is like, like you do need to load those muscles to load the tendon in kind of specific ways, but like kind of conventional strength training will do that pretty well. <laughs> so like, it's definitely going to help that. Tenositivitis of your bicep tendon generally happens because you get anterior glide from a dysfunctional so shoulder joint because you're not keeping the ball in the middle of the socket. So by doing these exercises, you're helping that type of injury because again, it's all about that 
like improving the system. And same with impingement of the shoulder joint, that narrowing of the subacromial space that leads to either bicep, te- uh, sorry, the supraspinatus rotator cuff tears or calcification or tendinopathy. Like the same exercises are going to be focusing on the typical weak points in someone's system that leads to those things happening. So while there is certain specificity that's needed in shoulder rehab, and that's why it's so important to work with professional, you still almost always will like just need these kind of key things. And again, as you said, like context matters where, you know, this program where it's like those rehab specific exercises, what like most people are lacking, but for some people it might not be like the case because they might've done those before. And it might be more like your big movements, like you're pushing and pulling needs a bit of technique refinement or just better loading variables, which is exactly what you get in the UMS program as part of like your typical programming. So yeah, that's the, I think zooming back in on like that question is yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely and and i will say you know I, I was talking off camera to phil prior to this recording and and explaining that i'd just finished a, a bench press workout at the gym and and i had someone ask me a question about an exercise i was doing that looks fundamentally flawed because i'm moving the dumbbell on a horizontal plane whilst lying down on my side meaning that you know the load is pushing the the, the dumbbell that way and i'm moving it this way and he didn't quite understand what was going on there. And I said, and, and I, I explained to him, look, this is a, an activation exercise because historically I've had over dominant upper trapezius, which would mean that in the failing point of a heavy lift, like a bench press, my shoulders want to shrug and, and the upper trap wants to sort of help stabilize and, and, and carry some of the load. But it's super important when you're pressing a very, very heavy load in something like a bench press that you keep the shoulders stable and 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 in the right spot because we want to avoid that joint glide and and the 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 the, the possibility of impingement active impingement where you could really damage that supraspinatus tendon under so much load and in in explaining that he he sort of went oh wow yeah right okay you know and, and so there is this this constant need to ensure that especially something like the shoulder joint is functioning properly as a system as a whole and you you know it's so common and i see this all the time how many times do you see someone in the gym the moment they lift up a weight the shoulders elevate even if it like physiologically as a as an engineer should be pulling the body down you know you've got this heavy load in the bicep like i see it all the time when someone does a bicep curl that as soon as they load they do this as they're lifting it up it's just so common because we have this overactive dysfunctioning system in in, in the upper shoulder and these are the things that if you take care of and phil brushed over it very very briefly there but i can't stress how important this is simple technique optimization of the fundamental movement patterns like a bench press like a bent over row like a a pull up or chin up or a, a shoulder press obviously squats deadlifts we're not talking about the lower body but we will in a, in a later episode. This is, it, it can have such a profound effect on your overall health. And it was actually a really interesting and quite refreshing experience working in Unity Gym when you had the clinic open and you were working with Nilesh to, to observe you guys and the way you worked with your patients. Because, you know, unlike what my interpretation of a physiotherapist was where you go and lay down on a bed and they m- manipulate you and 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 do s- s- some like massage and you know they might do needling and, and and taping and whatever else you guys spent very little time inside the clinic and most of your time outside looking at people exercise and then fixing the way that they did their workout and i found that really really interesting and that had a profound effect on our programming you know we went from really this focus of structural balance training in the beginning to technique optimization in the beginning. And then structural balance came after that, you know, because you could have such a big effect on someone's, you know, micro loading of the body. If you just get rid of the bad behavior they've got when they're under the barbell or under the dumbbell. If yeah, I guess, it's, hey. a, it's an interesting one where like there is a place obviously for hand, well, not obviously, but like there is a place for hands on, there is a place for taping, all these things, but often it's like, a you know and it's you see a lot in professional sports but like they're getting everything else right but so often patients come in and like they're not getting the kind of fundamentals right and then expect to have like the cherry on top as being the main treatment so yeah and i'm always just really passionate about helping people figure out how to manage themselves because obviously if i can you know help you feel better in the half an hour you're in the clinic but you're not making progress with your life then that's not ideal but coming back to like what causes injury it's going to be a combination of like technique matters but it's not everything. You can have great technique and poor macro loading. So sets, reps, intensity, all the other factors we talk about. 
and still be injured and you can have like terrible technique but really good macro loading and you might not get injured so it's always that combination and the thing is with technique and i think it's an interesting thing that you like you know you're talking about doing that exercise it's it's a way of like helping you like mentally switch on to the muscles that you need to activate to maintain the shoulder position. And so I think something that people get wrong is like sometimes technique can be changed from just thinking about it in a different way. Like sometimes it's just the right cueing and sometimes it is strengthening muscles and you need like adequate strength in a muscle to get to the point where you can do technique and you can't do it unless you've had that strength. But I think sometimes people like spend too long trying to like strengthen a thing to get the technique when they're actually just not cued in a way that like, they could just switch it instantly. So, um, yeah, does that make sense? Is like a absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, like, and look, you can have very strong, you could have very strong lower trapezius muscles, and just but never like make that connection from your brain to your lower traps to activate while you're doing another movement. So again, it is that like sometimes you need the technique, sometimes you need a exercise that helps you isolate that and connect your brain to it. And sometimes you need the actual strength of that muscle. And, that, and that's one of the things with like the patients that I've been working with who do your re- shoulder rehab program. It's, and where I found I've been able to be quite helpful is like sometimes they spend a lot of time on those exercises while ignore it, like while kind of pulling back on the big fundamental movements. And they spend too long in that kind of like activation thing when really like they just need to then learn how to apply it into the big movements. And they've kind of not got like a necessarily a weak link in terms of strength. They've just got a weak link in terms of mentally using those muscles while doing the big lifts as well. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, look, there's, 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 I think there's five or six different adaptations in strength and only one of them is the hypertrophy of the muscle, the, the enlargement of the actual muscle tissue itself. The rest of them are neurological adaptations, you know, the, the coordinating of s- certain muscles firing, the, the ability to downregulate muscles that aren't required in the movement and regulate muscles that are required in the movement, you know, the, the firing of muscle motor and all these sort of things are neurological. They're, they're, it's about, you know, brain body connection as opposed to sitting there and, and, and jacking up your muscles, you know, and that sort of comes as a byproduct of the rest of it occurring first, you know. So I like to get people to understand that, you know, strength is a skill and it's heavily neurological, you know. It's not, it's not, it's not just about muscles and muscle tissue itself. And, and when you start to understand that, then, you, you know, fundamentally it can, it can have a positive impact on the way you train. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's that's a pretty good broad spectrum to answer the question of whether the, the you know the slap tear rehab program that we offer does help other injuries. Look, we have a, a, a plethora of different training programs, and and the reality is is that every time you come into our online coaching, for whatever reason you're coming into, you're going to get a custom program that's specific to your needs, based on everything that we've spoken about here. And and in extreme cases, we're going to refer you on to work with Phil because you may need to work with a physio. And I think getting that initial period of rehab, you know, that's where it's really important to get the right diagnosis by the right person and get the right expert in your corner who's going to guide you through this. Because of course, that whole, the the mental side of an injury, the psychology of an injury is super important. And, and, And we're going to go deep into that in the next episode, why that's so important, you know, and how fundamentally it can impact your recovery. So I hope you guys do join us for that. Phil, thank you very much for, for your time today. And it's a pleasure. I always like to finish on a a note to really just give you some positive affirmation for joining us here. You know, there is a plethora of content available online now and you've chosen to stick with us for almost half an hour and and in, in doing that, improving yourself and your health. So kudos to you. Well done. Thanks for joining us. If you did like the content or you think it's going to be useful to others, then please Gently caress that like button and leave us a comment about how you're going with your injury, with your body, with your training. We yeah, always we, we covered a lot of things there, and like I'd love to hear questions that come out of that. And yeah, because I'm sure that yeah, there's there's like we talked very generally, and I'd love to hear like the specifics in your situation and do that. Absolutely, and of course, this this whole discussion came off the back of someone's question, a, a few questions, and so does the next episode coming. So, definitely get your comments and questions in there. We love to hear from you guys, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you.